good afternoon. Today, uh, the College adopted the enlargement report. It is now 10 years ago that the protests on Maidan started. Maidan protests where people were shot because they wrapped themselves into a European flag. And now, 10 years later, today is a historic day because today the Commission recommends that the Council opens accession negotiations with Ukraine and with Moldova. The Commission also recommends the opening of EU accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina once the necessary degree of compliance with the membership criteria is achieved. And the Commission recommends that the Council grants Georgia the status of a candidate country on the understanding that certain reform steps are taken. Let me focus on these four countries. First, on Ukraine. Ukraine continues to face tremendous hardship and tragedy provoked by Russia's war of aggression, and yet the Ukrainians are deeply reforming their country, even as they are fighting a war that is existential for them. And um, could convince myself well over 90% of the necessary steps that we set out last year in our report. Just to give you an idea, main progress has been achieved on the constitutional justice reform, on the selection of the High Council of Justice, the anti corruption program, progress on anti money laundering, important measures to curb the oligarchs' grip on the public life, new media law, and progress on national minorities. The remaining reforms are already on their way, that's good, and the Commission commends these efforts. And on this basis, we have recommended today that the Council opens accession negotiations. We also recommend that the Council adopts a negotiating framework once Ukraine has carried out the ongoing reforms. And on that, we will report then in March 2024. Moldova. Moldova is not facing a kinetic war, but Moldova is the subject of constant destabilization efforts against its democracy. It also suffers the consequences of the war in Ukraine. Moldova is welcoming a large number of Ukrainian refugees, Moldova is facing disruptions and blackmail related to its energy system. But like Ukraine, Moldova has undertaken significant reform efforts. For example, in the area of the judiciary, it has stepped up considerably the investigative work related to corruption and organized crime. It has made legislative changes to fight vested interests. So here too, the Commission recommends that the Council opens accession negotiations. There are some remaining measures that have to be finished. And on this basis, here too, the Council could then finalize the negotiating framework and the Commission will report on the progress to Council in March 2024. Now, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We recognize a number of positive political and legal steps. For example, the swift entry into office of a new Council of Ministers in January 2023. Um, the commitment of political parties to the goal of accession have, without any doubt, brought positive resu results. There is progress in the fight against organized crime, money laundering and terrorism, for example. But we also note with concern the various unconstitutional laws adopted by the representatives of the Republika Srpska entity. And against this backdrop, the Commission recommends to the Council the opening of accession negotiations once the necessary degree of criteria is achieved. And here, too, the Commission will report to the Council on progress by March 2024. To Georgia, 
Here, the College fully supports the genuine aspirations of the overwhelming majority of its citizens. by the authorities who should engage more with the opposition of national interest. This is needed by the government on the 12 priorities identified last year before candidate status was granted. The Commission also acknowledges a number of positive steps, for example, The personalized approach was withdrawn and the Anti-Corruption Bureau was set up. Therefore, the Commission recommends to grant candidate status to Georgia on the understanding that the government takes important reform steps. Now, in general, to conclude, enlargement is a vital policy for the European Union. And this has been my main message since the beginning of my mandate. Completing our union is the call of history. It is the natural horizon of the European Union. The citizens of countries that want to join are Europeans, just like those of today's union. Because we all know that geography, history, and common values bind us. So completing our union also has a strong economic and political and geopolitical logic. We have seen, if you see the history of the last enlargement rounds, they have shown that there is an enormous benefit, both for those countries who access the European Union and the European Union itself. Basically, we all win. And you can see it for the new members, their citizens and businesses. There's access to our four freedoms, access to our single market. Citizens can travel. Businesses have new markets, and all of this is a powerful lever to increase prosperity and therefore stability in these countries. But for the European Union itself, the advantages are also very clear and impressive. The expansion of our single market brings economy of scale for our businesses, increases our competitiveness, and therefore the strength of our single market. Our history of enlargement has been economic success story. But also if you look at the global and it offers partner. Just take the fact um, that the common purchase of gas being 27 makes a huge difference in the success of this uh, in this field. Enlargement is also an investment in our security because integrating new members in the e European Union shields those new members also from foreign interference and it stabilizes our neighborhood, therefore. In times where we see the rules-based international order increasingly called into question, of course a larger and stronger European Union gives us a stronger voice in the world. So in sum, enlargement is a unique opportunity both for the countries aspiring to join the European Union and, of course, for us. It is a driver for peace and prosperity that makes our union so special. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I need to continue where our president has just uh, left off. Today we are not only presenting you uh, the enlargement report that we do every year, but I think today we are also bringing forward a very strong, powerful response to the assignment made also by the European Council, namely to accelerate the enlargement process. You see the recommendations that we are making. And never before we have seen EU membership being such an important driver for countries around the European Union. So I would want to highlight other 
is the growth plan which we consider to be a completely new and bold approach to catalyze the progress of closing the economic and social gap between the Western Balkans and the EU and creating the possibility of early integration of the region into the European Union even before they join our uh, Union. Because part of our job when we uh, tell you about the reports, but this time let's focus on the, as we call it, the real or the integration on the ground, meaning how our societies and our countries together with our Western Balkan partners. It is a real benefit for the both of us. And it should bring the benefit of membership already before accession. This is also a request made by the member states this year, but it was also our plan when we started working back in 2020 when we have put on the table the new methodology for enlargement. The plan is aimed at four things. First of all, to integrate the Western Balkan partners who are interested into the four freedoms as fast as they can and as fast as they can cope with taking on all the obligations stemming from our regulations and rules. For that, we are of course happy to help them. We are happy to put at their disposal every tool to make it happen. But we have a request in return and our request is that this should also contribute largely to the stability, security and prosperity of the region as such. And this is why we ask them to treat each other like they are going to treat us. Meaning, once they are integrating themselves with the four freedoms, they should reciprocate this with other partners in the Western Balkans who are also delivering on the four freedoms. The other key pillar of this plan is to help the Western Balkan partners to accelerate the reform process. Because, of course, integrating yourselves with the four freedoms entails difficult, complex reforms. The Western Balkans. And this is why we would like to engage with them and we would like to draw up together with them a very down-to-earth, detailed plan for every to accelerate the progress on the ground when it comes to into the European Union. The third element I want to raise is, of course, that once they are integrating themselves with uh, our markets, of our markets and social systems. And they cannot start to close the gap without our financial support. And this is why we are ready to do more also there. And we are ready to provide more support to accelerate this common work. And this is why we are proposing to the Council to increase our financial contribution in supporting the reform agenda and provide an additional uh, 6 billion euros of support that should bring their aid intensity levels comparable to our cohesion and structural funds countries already by the end of this uh, multi-annual financial framework. So all in all, we are confident that with this plan we can help the region to raise at least another third of its of its uh, GDP, all together from the common regional market, from our financial contributions, we think that we can really boost the region. A boost that they need and the boost that we need as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now take some questions. Irina.
Thank you, Eric. Uh, news agency Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sommer. Uh, Madam President, a uh, very short question for you. When exactly we can expect that negotiation with Ukraine start in reality? And second part of uh, this question, because you know very well situation in Ukraine on the ground. What is your opinion? How long it will last? I mean, negotiation. Thank you. So, um, to take the second question first, um, it depends, of course, it's a merits-based process, so it depends on the speed of reform and um, uh, yeah, change of uh, topics that are necessary in this ne negotiation process. But how does it start? We give today the recommendation to open uh, accession negotiations. This is very important to the Council. The Council then takes the political decision. We have a European Council mid-December. There this will be on the table. If the Council takes the political decision to say yes, the, we take uh, the recommendation of the Commission and open accession negotiations, the work can start immediately. It's very technical what then starts. Um, we have a few, or Ukraine has a few um, uh, reforms still, if I may say, in the pipeline, in the making, on their way. They have to finish that work. It is explicitly uh, in our recommendation. And by March, we will then report on the progress. But we can start immediately when the European Council has given green light um, in its decision in December. Thank you, Kirill. Yeah. Yes, Madam von der Leyen, can you clarify the difference between recommendation to Ukraine and Moldova and the one to Bosnia, as there is not a clear cut in Bosnian case? Can this be considered as conditional recommendation or no recommendation as, at all because you still didn't recommend opening of accession talks? Thank you. Oh, yes, we recommend um, the opening, um, now Bosnia and Herzegovina, we recommend the opening of accession negotiations um, once certain criteria are uh, met. Let me take a picture. We open the door very wide and we invite Bosnia and Herzegovina now to go through this door. For that, of course, there has to be activity in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Results have to be shown. But the door is now opened very wide to welcome Bosnia and Herzegovina for the accession talks. You need to press the button on the mic and then wait until it's red. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Eric, thank you so much for giving me the floor. And uh, Madam uh, President, Mr. Commissioner, uh, first of all, I want to start with huge thank you <laughs> because it's a very emotional day for us. It's a historic day and I'm happy that I'm here and I'm sharing these moments with you. Uh, we want candidate status and we want to reach uh, membership of this organization. Uh, can you tell us more about the next step? When should Georgia expect opening negotiations as Ukraine and Moldova? And what are the conditions? Because there will be many questions about it. And I want also to use this opportunity and ask my second question. This week, Russian occupied forces, Russian soldiers killed our Georgian citizen in front of uh, Georgian church. Can you comment on this also? Thank you so much. So first of all, it is a day to celebrate in Georgia. Indeed, candidate state. Uh, we say um, there are still topics to be done, um, homework to be done, and this is detailed out in the report and in the recommendation, but it's a big step forward for Georgia. Um, and this also acknowledges the majority of the people in Georgia to join the European Union. You want? Yeah, yeah. I'm coming. <laughs> the, uh, yes, we, we have followed uh, what has happened. And of course, we stand by the territorial integrity of Georgia, and of course uh, this is an alarming news. 
that on the territory which is controlled by the government of Georgia, something like this can happen. So I think uh, we need to help Georgia to find the perpetrators. Uh, we are standing by in full solidarity uh, with the people of Georgia and with the government of Georgia. To opportunity, Mendugas Lukagalis from Lithuania National Radio and Television. Uh, in the past decade, uh, I have a question for Madam President. In the past decade, uh, we've seen that EU enlargement process has lost its momentum and basically stopped. There was no progress. How the Commission will ensure that this time the same story won't happen again, that the momentum that appears to be now uh, will continue uh, from the EU side? Thank you. Yes, what we see already, what we experience, is that the momentum is already there. Um, so the atrocious war that Russia unleashed against Ukraine, of course, has created in, an enormous push forward because uh, it is very clear uh, the neighborhood, our neighborhood, has to choose um, where they want to go. Um, and uh, the Western Balkans, um, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine have very clearly chosen they want to join the European Union. And this gave a momentum and an impetus to those countries that is remarkable. Um, if, you see, if you look into the report and you see the list of reforms achieved, it shows the determination and the steadfastness that is behind the political will and the will of the population, the people, to move towards the European Union. Um, and also for us, it is a very important moment because we know that these countries are our European family. We want them in the European Union. There is work to be done, but we are very clear about what our aim is. And uh, therefore, uh, I, it, I also always call on all of us to use this momentum now to uh, finish the work. It's hard work still ahead of us, but we are on a very good project, trajectory and uh, this momentum should be used. Augustin. Uh, thank you. Augustin Palokai from Utah and East Croatia. I have a question on Kosovo, the only country now that doesn't have at least recommendations, uh, even for candidate status, uh, out of 10 that are in the package. Uh, so uh, when you visited the region, you said uh, that Serbia should... Uh, make a de facto recognition of uh, Kosovo. This is a statement also by the leaders of three biggest uh, EU member states. What's are your, uh, what are your expectations uh, for Kosovo? Because uh, Kosovo cannot count only in the undefined European path without the clear perspective of becoming a candidate country. Thank you. I think it is important for Kosovo um, that has a very uh, clear goal also to join the European Union, that we are very clear also what we expect from Kosovo um, and that the country can deliver. Uh, we have discussed when I was in the region um, the implementation of the draft statute that Kosovo um, has gotten for uh, the municipalities. Um, and this implementation would be a big step forward. It's in the interest of Kosovo. I also think that um, if we look at Kosovo and Serbia, it is important for us that we give each country its unique possibility to move forward towards the European Union, so not to tie too much both together, because the incentive is much more positive if the question that we ask is, what is your contribution um, of, by, to move towards the European Union, what are your activities, and that we emphasize the country's genuine contribution to their, uh, on their path toward the European Union. You want to add something? Yeah, just or? One, one sentence. Um, I think it is also very important to see that, uh, yes, there is an application for membership uh, put forward by Kosovo. It is in the Council, and the Council has not an opinion on it. We are ready to provide the opinion. It is not my task to interpret the position of the Council or the Member States, but our feeling is, um, and you can also read this in our report, is that for Kosovo, the European path is coming through a successful dialogue.
Yes, please. Please present yourself. You need to take the mic. No. Right next to you, there's a mic. And push the button and wait until it's red. First of all, thank you for um, recognizing Moldova's effort to become a full state uh, EU member. And our question is, uh, if one of the EU members uh, countries doesn't not uh, vote in, in the upcoming summit for um, uh, the open of negotiations, so what are the next steps for Moldova? And does it... Thank you. So um, I think it's very important, I'm very confident uh, that uh, Moldova will move on because uh, your track record, Moldova's track record is impressive. Under very difficult circumstances, you are deeply strengthening and reforming your country. And uh, we are speaking about a merits-based process. Here are the merits of Moldova. Uh, that we uh, have to acknowledge, and this is uh, what we're speaking all about. Therefore, I'm not fixing it on a date. A merits-based process um, does not, is not fixed to a date, but you can be faster or you can be slower. And Moldova is showing uh, what a fast progress uh, looks like. Bruno. British. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> as, as you said, um, uh, history is calling. Um, there's a real surge um, in the aspirations um, of the neighbourhood of Ukraine, Moldova, um, to join the EU. You said that Ukrainians and the Moldovans in very, very difficult circumstances have done a lot of homework, 90% um, for Kyiv. Um, that's pretty impressive. Um, but what about the European side? Um, what message have you got to European governments who've got quite a lot of homework uh, to do themselves. When do you want to see that homework completed? So, indeed, it is impressive to see um, that the countries uh, that are uh, we discussed here on the podium um, all have understood the call or heard the call of history, um, and that is that you have to choose. Um, you want democracy and prosperity, or you want uh, an authoritarian regime and dependence of uh, the judicial system. You want uh, to join the European Union, then there are certain steps to be taken. But we also have the discussion, of course, in the European Union, because democracy, it, we're never done with the work for democracy. We have always to keep up the good work and always make sure that democracy is alive and working. And this is a principle of values. Values are universal, but the question is whether we live them. If we live them, then it is connected to our, to our discussions at home, to our input uh, in uh, creating the necessary legal framework. Um, so democracy is something that you have to earn every single day. Now, more focused on the accession process, um, it is very good that we also have started the discussion internally what does this mean for the European Union and its structures? And this shows that we are very serious about enlargement. We are not only asking the countries that want to join the European Union um, to undergo reforms and to perform towards the European Union, but we are also asking ourselves what do we have to do to be ready for an enlargement by countries that are mature. Next to Giovanni. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to ask a question? No, not Giovanni, next to you. Yes, sorry, I don't know your first name. Ja, ich hätte gerne zwei Fragen auf Deutsch, bitte. Die erste Frage, äh, Frau von der Leyen. Ihr Amtsvorgänger, Herr Juncker, hält die Ukraine wegen der grassierenden Korruption für nicht beitrittsfähig und hat vor falschen Versprechen gewarnt. Haben Sie sich mit ihm darüber unterhalten und halten Sie einen Status unterhalb der Vollmitgliedschaft für möglich? Und die zweite Frage, Sie empfehlen den Status Verhandlungen mitten im Krieg. Das ist, glaube ich, ein Präzedenzfall. Welchen Sinn machen Verhandlungen über einen EU-Beitritt im Krieg? Und könnte ein Beitritt bei anhaltenden Kämpfen oder sogar Gebietskonflikten stattfinden? Dankeschön. Okay, okay, cool. 
So, um, der, der Fortschritt, den wir in der Ukraine sehen, ist beeindruckend. Die Ukraine, die bereits vor zehn Jahren, ähm, als die Maidan-Proteste begannen, sehr deutlich gemacht hat, dass ihr größter Wunsch ist, die Europäische Union, der Europäischen Union beizutreten, die Bevölkerung kämpft darum seit zehn Jahren jetzt, hat nicht nur ähm, diesen Wunsch ausgedrückt, sondern arbeitet täglich hart daran, alle die Reformen auch durchzuführen, die notwendig sind, um, die Europäische Union, um der Europäischen Union beizutreten. Und diese Reformen sind beeindruckend, der Kampf gegen Korruption, der Kampf gegen ähm, Geldwäsche, die Festigung und Stärkung des äh, juristischen Systems, das ist, sind nur einige Beispiele der Reformen, die in äh, den letzten Monaten durchgeführt worden sind. Wir sehen Ergebnisse, ähm, die umgesetzt werden im täglichen Leben der Ukraine, also dass nicht nur das Gesetz da ist, sondern auch die Umsetzung des Gesetzes da ist. Und deshalb ist es richtig, jetzt die Eröffnung der Beitrittsgespräche und Beitrittsverhandlungen mit der Ukraine vorzuschlagen. Ähm, ich bin der festen Überzeugung, dass es auch eine Stärkung der Ukraine ist in ihrem beeindruckenden Kampf gegen den Angriffskrieg, den Russland gegen sie führt. Ähm, wir stehen voll an der Seite der Ukraine und deshalb ist das auch noch mal ein ganz klares Signal der Unterstützung äh, der Europäischen Union der Ukraine. Um, actually, um, we, we, we know by experience we know by experience that uh, this uh, process can take. Um, well, it's, it is a process that is taking forever. So basically, I would like to understand how to make sure that this is not about uh, creating false warning about this, and I'm thinking about Portugal. And since I'm talking about Portugal, um, let me ask you also this question. Um, are you aware or are you surprised by the fact that uh, Prime Minister Costa um, uh, quit uh, yesterday? And have you talked to each other? And uh, most, most, um, the most important thing is, do you see a risk here for the implementation of the RRF in Portugal? So we follow uh, the news uh, from Portugal, and it is now up to the national authorities to investigate. Um, I think if we've discussed a lot now the length of accession negotiations or the process of accession. Um, perhaps it's worth to look Uh, at the countries that joined already the European Union. And there you see that um, the time period they needed to join the European Union is very different. And it depended very much on uh, the activities a country developed and the speed it made with the reforms. So once again, um, stating that it is a merits-based process implies um, you can speed up if you want to. And I think the last 20 months have shown that a lot of countries that want to join the European Union have heard this call. They have intensified the reform. They have sped up the reform process. Um, and they have strengthened their institutions. Not all of them, but the vast majority is following the call of history. Uh, it's in their hand, but it's in our interest. Jean. Oui, bonjour. Euh, ici. Euh, bonjour. Jeanne Grandin, journaliste à l'Opinion. Euh, plusieurs pays ont... Vous voulez que je fasse dise en anglais ou I can do it in English <rire> C'est le volcan. <rire> okay. Plusieurs pays ont suggère que si on intègre tous ces nouveaux pays dans l'UE, il faudrait développer l'idée d'une UE à, à cercle concentrique parce que ça ne sera pas possible d'avoir le même fonctionnement institutionnel avec tous ces nouveaux pays. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'en effet, cette idée d'une Europe à géométrie variable ou à cercle concentrique est possible Et est-ce que vous, vous pourrez proposer des, des changements en ce sens au Conseil pour leur dire ce qu'il est possible de faire institutionnellement Merci. Peut-être que vous commencez 
what you see proposed today should also contribute accelerating uh, the whole enlargement process. And this is why, for example, the growth plan is going to be fundamental. But as the President also said, this is a merit-based process. So there are things we cannot do instead of the candidate countries. It is their, it is their work that counts. Their work is the basis of any enlargement. Now, on the, uh, on the institutional reforms, yes, uh, the institutional reforms are discussed in the Council. But if there is one message, I think, coming through is that, uh, first of all, there is, no, there is no conditionality between enlargement and institutional reforms. The second is that uh, the EU is fit for enlargement with the current set of treaties and with the current set of rules, and we should be able uh, to enlarge and welcome new member states even on the basis uh, of the current treaties. Yes, one can always think about how to improve, how to further evolve, but this is not because of enlargement. This is because we want to improve our European Union. So these are two separate discussions and we should keep them separate. Perhaps um, if we have the topic of speed again, this gives me the opportunity to emphasize um, the second proposal today um, that has been adopted by the Commission, that is the growth plan. And I want to emphasize what you already said, um, Commissioner. What we're doing here is exceptional because we know by experience from f uh, former enlargement rounds that the miracle of prosperity came with joining the, uh, the single market. Um, we saw in the accessing countries, the countries that joined, a huge rise in living standard. And it was also beneficial for our internal market. And therefore, we are already starting this process now with a growth plan. It is exceptional that we propose to say we open our single market in seven important sectors for you, um, the Western Balkans. We expect you to also open among you the common regional market. If you only open the common regional market, it is a boost of 10% for their GDP. But joining also our single market already now could double their economies in, one, in the next decade. Um, and for that, we of course say we need a level playing field. You have to be competitive. So we accompany that with reforms that you are doing plus investment. And this is a huge step forward that we take already now. We do not wait till there is the final decision of accession, the political accession, but we already open the doors of economic prosperity and joining the single market and enlarging for also for our single market businesses, the market towards the common regional market in the Western Balkans. Thank you. Uh, Philippe Régnier on Interaction. Oui, bonjour, merci. Excusez mon absence qui est due à un petit Covid. Euh, J'ai une question plus politique que pour la présidente. Euh, vous soulignez que l'élargissement est un investissement dans euh, notre sécurité, dans la stabilité du continent. Euh, mais comment, euh, comment est-ce que je peux expliquer à mes lecteurs que c'est le cas vis-à-vis -vis de l'Ukraine, qui est un pays en guerre, en partie occupé, et si demain la paix euh, revient en Ukraine, eh bien, elle sera toujours euh, voisine d'un pays euh, belliqueux, euh, éventuellement même euh, revanchard. Alors comment expliquer cela, que donc euh, cet élargissement en, en l'État est un investissement dans notre stabilité, dans notre sécurité Merci beaucoup. Russia goal was to wipe Ukraine off the map. If Russia would have succeeded, you can imagine what that would have meant for our security. It is good that Russia's strategic goals, Russia failed on its strategic goals. Um, on the contrary, Ukraine as a nation is stronger than ever before. Um, and this shows how important it is to stabilize the Ukrainian democracy, to stand by them, and to make sure that um, they will overcome this massive aggression. 
and uh, the war unleashed by Russia against Ukraine. If you take the wider circle of countries that want to join the European Union, as I think we both said at the beginning of this press conference, um, this is a decisive time. The countries have to take, make choices and very clearly to say which side they are choosing. And it is very clear also when you travel through the region and the countries that want to join the European Union we are reporting on today, they also are very clear that they want to join the European Union because they see the difference. There are several countries trying to interfere in that process. But for us is to keep up the good work and to give them the strength they need uh, on their path forward towards the European Union. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the press conference. Thank you. There will be a technical briefing following this press conference. Thank you.